In this episode of When Life Hands You Lennons, I'm taking a little bit of a different approach to the show because with this guest's vast knowledge and experience within the industry, I really didn't have any other option. I really actually hope that you enjoy this structure um, with Miss Davy J. So, Miss Davy J is an intellectual property and entertainment lawyer here in Orlando, Florida. She is currently the chair of the Entertainment Arts and Sports Law section of the Florida Bar. She has worked on deals with major clients, including HBO, Warner Chapel, Discovery, Telemundo, Sony, Columbia, and Sub Pop. She's also represented Oscar and Grammy winning artists. So Davy has quite a bit of knowledge and experience within her respected realm as a lawyer. And this episode, I, like I said, take a different approach and we walk through the entire songwriting process. So from conceptualization all the way out to promoting and touring your album, basically. We walk through some of the barriers that you will run into, some things that you can avoid to uh, prevent running into those barriers, including having your split sheets figured out, your copyrights assigned properly, such as your cover art, making sure that you own that, and then making sure that your royalties are split correctly and why that's important. We also talk about registering your track with the United States Copyright Office and why that's important. So this episode is also going to be paired with a nice lengthy blog post, which I will link link in the show notes. So use it as a go-to guide when you have questions about the songwriting process, as there will be all kinds of helpful links and uh, questions answered in there. And you can also, if you have any additional questions about it, you can reach out to me. I will do my best to answer them as long as they're not too uh, legally challenging, I guess you could say. I hope that you enjoy this in-depth episode with Miss Davy J as we break down the entire songwriting process. Please enjoy this episode with Davy J. So we have Miss Davy J. She is an entertainment and intellectual property lawyer here at Mealy NJ. She's going to talk about some of the legal barriers and things you should be watching out for during the songwriting process. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So let's just jump right in here. Um, the first thing that kind of comes in with the songwriting process is kind of the concept and planning stage. You're planning out what you want to do, kind of the, the genre you want to do. When there are multiple people kind of in that process, kind of planning, is there any type of protection they should be looking out for, barriers, things like that? Yeah, you know, it's it's not the fun part, which I understand why it gets overlooked. You know, I know the fun part is actually creating the work. Um, but you do want to take some time aside to talk to these other writers, to the people you're collaborating with, about what your thoughts and plans are as far as who's going to own the song, who's going to control the rights to the song, which might be different. You know, it could be that you and I write a song together and we both own it, but I'm the one who's actually more or less, you know, doing the management of the song, you know, the administration and the licensing and all that stuff. So you want to get that set ahead of time because it's so much easier to agree on things before you have a work to fight over than it is to create the work and then later realize that you're not on the same page. You know, so that's the best idea is to try to figure those roles out first and foremost. And then, you know, best case scenario would be to have some sort of agreement between you. So like a collaboration agreement, for example, which would lay out, you know, who has the right to do what with this this song, who can license it, who gets revenue, who gets what percentage of revenue, things like that. So um, it's kind of like a lot of people are familiar with a split sheet. And a split sheet just divvies up ownership percentages, but it doesn't say, you know, who controls the song, which one of us is in charge of doing that. So it's kind of like 
a split sheet plus. You know, there's more to it than that. Okay, cool. So what about like, same thing with like project files, say somebody starts a project and then they send it over to their friend. Is there any type of thing there? Like for like a logic profile or anything like that? Is this kind of the same thing? Same kind of idea. Cause if, I mean, if you're sending it over to a friend, I guess it would intend on like what, what your purpose is there, what your intent is there. Like, so if you're sending it to somebody for them to work on it, that's one thing versus, you know, sending it to somebody to just listen to, check it out, get feedback, you know, that sort of thing. That's perhaps something different. Um, and it might, you know, that's something that you also want to discuss at the beginning is because, you know, like if you and I are working on something and you send it to your buddy, I'm like, dude, why have you, why have you shared that? Like he could release it to the world and, you know, I don't want that to happen. Or I don't think it's ready yet. A lot of people are very sensitive about like, this isn't ready for public consumption yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to keep the peace more so than anything else, it's one of those things you want to discuss at the front end. Absolutely. So, and a lot of people, I think, go back and forth with project, they'll send it and then their friend will basically write the song and then be like, Hey, it's done. Mm -hmm. But even though you contributed, even say an eight bar loop, you still have rights to that, correct? Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's where a lot of people tend to misunderstand the process as far as from the legal aspect. Um, because if you send it to a friend and they do something to it and send it back, and even if it's, you know, what what you would consider minor, they might not. You know, everybody sees their own contribution as more important, you know? Um, so it's entirely possible this friend could say, oh, well, now I own half of this song because I contributed to the writing of it or I contributed to its creation. Um and that could very well legally be the case. So you need to you know, set your uh, expectations right at the beginning and say, hey, check this out. If you have any suggestions, let me know. If you do anything to it, you know, if you don't want to share the rights, you got to have them sign off on a work for hire to make sure that they don't get to claim rights to anything. Cool. So that's kind of interesting. There's kind of a lot that goes into it before you even kind of start, really, Yeah. Um, that you should be thinking about. So now we're kind of, let's kind of get into actually writing the song. And so I have an interesting point here. How with, when you're starting to write the lyrics, the chord, you said that everything kind of has to be laid out, melodies, how, can you kind of explain what split sheets do and why they're important in a song like this? absolutely. A split sheet is just a really basic one page document and it states who are the contributors to that work. So whether it's the music or the lyrics um, and what their ownership percentages are. So it doesn't have to be equal. It can be. So it could be either 50-50. If it was the two of us, it can be 90-10, whatever we agree to. And people will sometimes say, well, you know, what's fair or what's standard? It's it's all a subject of negotiation. There are sometimes people who get a lot more percentage-wise just because of their name value. And it has nothing to do with the amount of contribution to the song. You know, um, because if you've got a featured artist or something like that, at that point, they can demand a good chunk of that just because, hey, well, I'm the featured artist. People are going to listen to this because I'm on it. Um, So a split sheet will accomplish that. And frequently, it also contains um, reference to each one of the writer's uh, performing rights organizations. So it'll say that they're affiliated with ASCAP or BMI. And if they have a publishing company they work with, it'll list that as well. Okay. And what about... Um, like working with studio time, how would that kind of work? In what way? Um, I guess just like booking it and having to pay for it and like who's negotiating all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Because there's a lot that goes, when you're getting into the studio, there's kind of a lot that can kind of come down. Because I don't know if it's true or not, but I had a friend or even I heard a story that they would have a bunch of people come into the studio and as these artists are working on these, people are out partying in the in behind the board. Mm-hmm. And could those people claim rights to the song if they say, I contributed to the lyrics? Oh, yeah. I mean, somebody can always make a claim. As far as like being in the studio goes, like my general rule is unless they signed something, they shouldn't be in there. And I know that goes against the whole like, hey, this is a good time and let's have people hang out. And let's you know what I mean? My like, group of friends come in. Right. I get it. Um, I totally understand that. I've been in the studio enough to know that you can, you know, that that atmosphere can actually help with creating something. You know, I I understand that. But at the same time, you know, yeah, that leaves the door wide open for somebody to come back later and say, hey, I was there. I helped write that song. Um, And then, you know, they're going to come back and claim, well, not only did I help write it, but I never signed anything. And so that means without them sign anything, signing anything, if they can prove that they actually did contribute to the song, 
that gives them an equal ownership share, which means equal rights. So not only do they get an equal amount of the revenue, but they have control over that song just like you do, which is really the scary part. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you, they don't sign anything, they shouldn't be in the studio. Right. Have you have you seen or heard of any cases like this or worked with any cases that have had that or kind of maybe similar, but like how does the outcome came? Yeah, it's it's crazy because it's something that it's just offering an opportunity for dispute, you know, and there's there's been a whole range of outcomes from things like that. Sometimes it's somebody just making noise like, oh, you know, I, I, I help write that song, but they never really do anything about it. Um, because if they really want to fight it, they would have to get an attorney and file suit and all this. And that's expensive, you know? So sometimes that right there is enough to discourage somebody from doing anything. But at the same time, you know, you still have to deal with the fact that there's somebody out there, you know, creating this, you know, dust up about you. And do you really want that to be part of your reputation as an artist? You know, like, Oh, so, you know, people are saying online that Lennon lets, you know, that he steals other people's work and doesn't give them credit. You know, like, you don't want that, you know? So that's, you know, I guess the best case scenario if somebody complains, you know, worst case scenario is they actually follow through and file a suit. Um, That really only happens when there's sufficient value in the song as far as monetary value. If that song's making money, they'll come after it. And, you know, unfortunately, it seems like no matter how strong or weak your case is, you can almost always find an attorney who will take it if you have the money to pay them. Not every attorney will be like, no, there's no claim here, or this is a very thin claim. Sometimes they'll just take it anyways, just because. And that will ruin your day, you know, even if you were right to begin with. And this person isn't really... They didn't cr- contribute enough to be considered a co-owner of the song. You still have to deal with that. You still have to fight it, you know, and that's a drain on your money and your good disposition. You know, nobody wants to deal with a lawsuit. I mean, it's it's kind of like, would you rather fight something as simple and stupid as that? Or would you rather fight something who's somebody where somebody's actually stealing your music and trying to claim it when they didn't? Um, the thing is, that was all avoidable. If you would have had them sign something then there wouldn't be a problem later on, you know? So that's, in my experience in the industry, most of the problems people encounter, they're totally avoidable if they would have done something beforehand. But they didn't think to, they didn't know to, or they were like, ah, we'll deal with that later. Ah, we don't need this. We were buddies. We don't need contracts, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's when problems kind of fester. The the, the song starts making money, and they start getting placed in ads and sync money. And And yeah, money comes in, love goes out the window. Exactly. Friendships go down the drain. Yep. Um, So recording is another big thing when you're in the studio working on melodies, but kind of the big thing prior to that is samples. Kind of you can, because you have to record samples, obviously. And you can record anything from outside to to in the studio vocals. It can be whatever it is. So we have done articles on EDM.com about stealing people's samples and using samples of other people's song. And a lot of hip hop music uses samples. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that for a little bit, because I think that kind of comes down to the songwriting process, writing, producing, kind of all that stuff. Most people say that if a sample is fewer than three seconds or five seconds or 10 seconds, I can use it without being, you know, singed with a copyright lawsuit. Is that true? No. If not, no. why is it? Can you break that down? And I know yeah. we discussed this in an article, right. but let's let's yeah, get let's it from get the- it. Yeah, there's no hard and fast rule in the law that says you can take X amount of a sound recording. That's just not there. That is an urban legend, right? You take any amount of a sound of a sound recording, you know, uh, you could be sued. That's potentially copyright infringement. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, like that ruins everybody's day because they're mm-hmm. like, "What do you mean?" Like, uh, you know. You know, and then they go, well, what about all these other people who sample? I know they didn't all get permission. They didn't all get licenses. Well, it's, you know, I always say it's like speeding. You know, just because other people speed doesn't mean it's suddenly legal. It just means they didn't get caught, right? You know, so it's no defense when you get caught to be like, oh, well, other people were speeding, officer, so let me go. You know, like that doesn't work. So you can't look around you and see what other people are getting away with and use that as a a metric for what you can get away with. Um, so, you know, that's perhaps the most important thing. And the other thing is to really think of it like, think of it like any other form of property that you have. You know, if I took your computer, you know, I just stole it from you, didn't ask, I took it, 
And, you know, later I gave it back. Does that mean I didn't steal it? No. No, I still stole you your still computer. Stole right, yeah, exactly. So it's the same with music, right? Um, there's really no difference. Or what if I, you know, took your computer, but I, you know, uh, changed it significantly. I put a bunch of stickers all over it, and I put in new programs and deleted some of the programs you had and changed your desktop picture. So it's really kind of, at first blush, unrecognizable as your computer. Does that mean I didn't steal your computer? No. So it's the same thing with music. So if you take a sample from somebody else's song and you manipulate it heavily so that it's unrecognizable, that doesn't mean it's legal. It just means it's less likely you're going to get caught. It's a little bit harder to notice. That being said, there's metadata in all the files. So it is discoverable. Mm -hmm. These are things we can find out just like, you know, your computer, any of your property you know, they've got the, the numbers on them that says, oh, well, this one was mine, you know, like, or your car's got a VIN number, that one's yours. So mm -hmm. it's, it's all discoverable. And what about the people that say, oh, I'll just delete the metadata then? I mean, <sighs> you would be amazed at what we could discover on your computer when we get a hold of that, because that's what winds up happening is we get, you know, we are able to go through and do forensics on your computer to figure out what was deleted by whom and when and all that stuff. And a lot of people suffer from the misconception that deleted means gone. It's really not. It's, Especially not in a computer. Right, exactly. It's Oh, it's most certainly not gone. It is still very much there. So even though you don't see it, it's there and it can be found. Yeah, just because you put it in the trash can and empty the trash does right. not oh, yeah. mean no, it no. is gone forever. Uh-uh, not at all. Not at all. Um so I was I was in an argument the other well, not argument but somebody was on Twitter and they I'm I'm still surprised at how how much and how much misconception and how much uh, ambiguity there is about copyrights and there was some kid on on Twitter that was saying oh you can use it without being caught if it's three seconds or whatever and then I said that's not true and he's like well this artist used Mario samples. I'm sure they didn't get caught and they released it on a huge label. Well, they probably got clearance right. from Nintendo to exactly. use that. Kind of, can you kind of explain how that would, how would you get that right to use something like that? Yeah. I mean, first it kind of depends on what you're using. So like your example, you know, using sounds from Mario. Yeah. You'd have to go to Nintendo and talk to them. And at that point you'd want to use, get permission, not just to use that sound recording, but also, potentially, that sound recording might have uh, a trademark. It's, it's entirely possible for sounds to be a trademark as well as a copyright, which are two totally different things, which most people don't understand. Copyright protects works of art. Trademark protects things that would be considered an identifier for your business, you know. And so there's lots of sounds and, you know, uh, an arrangement of notes that operate as a source identifier. So, you know... Um, in that case, that part of that permission would have to also be, oh, we have the right to use this trademark, you know, because a lot of stuff, you know, especially if you, you grew up like I did with Mario, you only need to hear a little clip of it. And in your head, suddenly, like the whole video game, the whole video game starts, your hands automatically yeah. go to the controller, even yeah. though you don't have one, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So that's absolutely a great example of a source identifier, our, our little you know, reptilian brains like are like, oh, that's the thing. And, you know, we, we go straight to it. So in that instance, you'd need to get permission from them for both of those rights. Um, and it can be done in one document, but you need to get both permissions. When it's not a trademark, so let's say it's just another song that you're going to sample, you need to get permission from the record label if there is a label. Um, if not, then whoever owns the copyright to the sound recording, probably the artist, if they're unsigned, it's still going to be theirs. And potentially, you'd also need to license what we call the musical work copyright, and that's the copyright to what's best conceived as like the music and lyrics, as opposed to how it was recorded. So think of like a cover version. You know, every time there's a cover of the song, it's the same underlying song, but it's different recordings. So depending on that, you might have to also get the permission from the music publisher if there is one. If not, then the songwriter. Okay, so. We could talk forever on that, um, but that was pretty good, um, an overview. And I wrote another thing here that I want to come back to, but I think it comes back to now we're getting into like, once you're done writing your song, you everything is done, the, the chords are done, the lyrics are done, everything's recorded, it's ready to go off to mixing and mastering. Do 
In today's day and age, I've heard some rumors that mix and mastering engineers may have rights to songs now. They may be able to claim royalties. Do they usually claim royalties? Can they? Well, you can always ask. Okay. Okay. So that's that's threshold thing is you, whatever you agree to. Okay. Is is you know open. There are some who do, and there are some who just as a rule do not. Um, who historically never have, you know. Um, and so I, I know examples in in both worlds. Um, and so for you know, in in some situations, they'll say, yeah, we want you know as you know uh, the mix engineer or you know mastering engineer. Not as much with mastering engineers, but um, you know. I want this much money plus this percentage. Um, it's also, again, because it's negotiable as an artist, you can go, okay, we don't have a bunch of cash on hand, but we can give you a percentage on the back end, you know, which sounds really good as far as like, hey, I can get this work done and I don't have to go out of pocket that much for it. But do keep in mind that that means you have to do the accounting and you have to give them a statement, usually twice a year, that shows all the money that was made from that track and here is their percentage. Um, so you are signing yourself up for an accounting jobs, <laughs> you know, like if you do this, yeah. you know, same thing from the other side of the coin is if you're the engineer and you're going to accept that, understand that, you know, your compensation is going to be dependent upon that artist doing the accounting, which, you know, when you're dealing with somebody, an artist who's signed, that's no problem. Their label is going to handle it. Right. But when you've got an unsigned artist, you've got to have a certain amount of faith that this person is actually going to keep up with that. Um, so there's that. So that's, you know, sometimes why, um, some engineers are like, you know what? No, I just, just give me the money. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just, give it's me my easier. Fee up front. Give me my fee. That's all, you know, and then that way we don't have to, you know, and nobody wants to hound somebody for money. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody enjoys chasing their payment, mm -hmm. you know? So sometimes it's better to just, you know, from that peace of mind standpoint, take the money. But, you know, if the song is going to be, if you think it's going to be a huge hit or you're working with an artist who's got a lot of potential. Or if you're working with an artist who like is really big already. Yeah. Then at that point, you might really want to consider like, hey, in the long run, this could be worth a lot more to me. So um, yeah, so those are some of the considerations that go into it. And is that working? Because that's something that is, it's kind of yes or no, like it's kind of a black and white area. That's something you should, should you consult an a lawyer to kind of figure that out? Yeah, because once we start talking about getting a percentage of, of royalties or even taking an ownership interest in the song, um, at that point, it needs to be done in writing. Um, otherwise, you're not going to be protected. Because it's not as simple as, oh, hey, after six months and it's making this much money, I'm going to get... 10% shake hands and it's a good deal. Like there's way more that goes so into So much it. more. Cause when we say 10%, like that's 10% of what? Yeah. And you know, there, like, there's the line right. like right there with the first question you've already walked into a gray area. Exactly. Because when we say 10%, does that mean like 10% of the sound recording royalties or publishing? does it mean 10% of the publishing or both? Is it 10% after money's recouped? What's recoupable? You know, is it before taxes? After right, taxes? exactly. And is Sync it licensing? Yeah, and is it back to for producers? They get usually get back to record one, which means like once all the money's recouped, they're now eligible to get their royalty, and that's payable. Their royalty is payable retroactive to the first album sold. So they say it was the first time the track was released, right? Um, whereas artists generally don't get that. So is that something that you're getting, or is it not? So there's it's. It seems easy to say 10%, but there's really so much more to there's it. Way yeah. Way more. Yeah. Um, so when the mix and master is done and you're being delivered a certain thing, should those, like, say, for example, you want uh, an MP3 and you want a WAV file and you want it cut a certain way and you want this version mixed quieter and this one mixed louder and et cetera, et cetera, that should also be in a contract and saying what you're being delivered with the engineer or how would that work? I, yeah. You know, even if you don't have it in the contract with them, be upfront with them about that because I know firsthand that that will frustrate the hell out of an engineer mm -hmm. where, you know, they deliver mixes to you and then the art, you, the artists go, Oh, well, I want this. Oh, I want that. Oh. And you know what I mean? Like they keep going back and, and they keep going back and you know, from the engineer's perspective, you they should be setting boundaries up front. Like, okay, I'm going to mix this, and this is how many, like, revisions you get or how many changes we do. You know, because otherwise, this could be the project that never dies. Yeah. You know? It could be. Because there are lots of artists who will continue to mess with something 
you know, eternally. And, you know, like, it's it's like chili. At some point, you got to stop cooking it and just eat it. Uh, you can't true. just keep adding spices, no, no, you know? You like, no. <laughs> at some point, you got to be like, all right, this is good. You know, so you got to figure out what's good, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, set real clear boundaries up front as far as from the artist's perspective. What do you expect? Because if you're not telling your engineer that, they're not reading your mind. And so the price that you're quoted is probably not the price for all of these different versions, you know, but it's a good idea to have all those versions, especially if you're planning on licensing, because you're going to want like an instrumental version. You're going to want a clean version, a radio edit. You're going to, you know what I mean? You want all of these different versions because it makes it easier to sell your music and license it out. We mentioned like mix engineers and mastering engineers kind of coming back and trying to claim royalties and stuff. And I don't know if I heard this with the Mo- Music Modernization Act, if that was kind of something that they were going to try to factor in. Could you kind of talk about that? I think this is kind of a good point to kind of mention that because I know there's been a lot of coverage on that. And what's your take on it? Like, what is it? Yeah, it's so basically what they're trying to do is bring copyright law up to speed with reality, I Mm -hmm. guess is the best way to put it, because the law moves very slowly. Technology in the industry moves very quickly. And so this just inherently creates problems. And so that's the whole point of the Music Modernization Act is to try to bring it up to speed, right? Um, and so one of the things that are in there, it's, it's basically looking to make sure that people get fair compensation. So to ensure that, you know, for example, producers are entitled to get a certain percentage for certain types of exploitation of tracks that they work on. Um, because, you know, at this point, it's really a function of agreement, not a function of entitlement, you know? So... That's part of it, um, and making sure that people get paid fairly for streaming and things like that. Because you know, if anybody who's familiar with the industry at all is aware that like streaming compensation is pitiful. Yes, like it's, it's just, it's bad. it's bad. It's so bad. It's you know, somebody once asked me, well, what's to stop an artist from just sitting there and listening to a song over and over again to get more royalties? I'm like, dude, if you knew how little they got paid per stream. You'd be listening for the next decade and see a check for about five bucks. Yeah, yeah, you could get yourself like uh, something off the dollar menu. (laughs) Yeah, basically. It's really sad. Uh, Radio also doesn't pay very much in royalties either, correct? So songs, I think it was Mm pre-1976, they don't get royalties for stuff played on the radio is that correct well the sound recording doesn't get doesn't generate revenue for public performance on the radio but the musical work does the publishing side so if you wrote the song every time the song plays on the radio or when it plays like in a store or in a restaurant or any place you go in public and there's music playing you know in a dance class or whatever every time that song plays it generates revenue Versus for the sound recording, it doesn't do that. Um, It's one of the shortcomings of the sound recording copyright. They are very limited copyrights when we look at them in comparison to all the other types of artwork out there. And so that's one of the things that a lot of people want to change as well is to say like, hey, you know, sound recordings should be eligible for this as well. And other countries do that. Um, other countries, the the radio stations, the clubs, the the stores and bars and restaurants or whatever, they all pay royalties for both the publishing side and the sound recording side for that public performance. And here we don't. Um, so the one difference though would be when it streams, um, you know, through like uh, Pandora, Spotify, something like that. Um, but yeah, so there's that big, you know, gaping hole there of compensation. So that means like as an artist, if you're doing a cover song. Every time that song plays, you're not making any money, but the songwriter is of the original version. Um, so that's that's kind of a bummer because it's like, hey, maybe it was the cover version that made it really popular. You know, like Sinead O'Connor, her version of Nothing Compares to You was massive and Prince got all the money for that playing, which I mean, whatever. You mm-hmm. know, it's, yeah. it, he wrote the song, he valued for it, but you know, she didn't get any money for all of the, the plays that that song got. Um, and there's tons of examples like that. So that's one of the, the shortcomings of sound recordings, unfortunately. Cool. So now let's get into kind of the, like the meat and potatoes of once everything is done, everything is said and done, we can get into releasing it and distributing it. So digital, I'm kind of, I've kind of gotten into a lot of digital distribution recently. I'm kind of contracting with a company that 
does it here in Florida, which is kind of interesting. And I've learned quite a bit about it. Digital distribution is basically you're releasing your music to Spotify, Apple, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Or you can do it independently or you can do it through a label. Is there, do you, what are the benefits of releasing through a label? And what are the benefits of releasing through independently? Because a lot of artists are going independent these days and they're seeing a lot of success with it. Yeah. And so, you know, here's the thing. Anytime you add a middleman, you got to expect something to be taken out for their their services. You know, you can go ahead and put air quotes in that word if you want to use services. It's like a coffee filter. You have the coffee filter is the label. Yeah. And then your song comes through, it's going to filter something out. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, the question really is what value do you get from that label's involvement? For some artists, they get great value from that. Other artists, they get really none at all. And it's actually a deficit, you know? So it's really not a question of, is it generally good or bad? It's a question of, is it good or bad for that particular artist? Um, So it really depends on the the label, if they're a good fit for the artist, the level of involvement, what they're doing for that artist, you know, kind of a thing. So that's, I guess, kind of a a case-by-case decision that you have to make. Like I have some clients who are adamantly against record labels and that's fine. And they're doing well. They don't need it. They do have publishing. They've got a publishing company that they're signed with, but they, you know, they do not, they are not interested in, in any way, shape or form, the involvement of a label. And, you know, good for them because it works for them. Other artists, particularly artists in another genre, they would not do as well, you know, without label involvement. They kind of need it. So it really depends. And some people, a lot of people think that they need to sign to a label in order to be successful. No. 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 100% wrong. 100% wrong. 150% wrong. Yes. Because um, a lot of artists, like I said, are doing very well these days independently. Yeah. And they're seeing a lot of money come in independently as well, as long as you set yourself up correctly. Right. And it's it's kind of like somebody saying, well, you have to go to college and graduate to make anything out of your life. No. You know, like, I'm a big fan of college. Clearly, I did a lot of it. You mm-hmm. know, like, for me, it was great. You have to, kind of, yeah. necessity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer and wing it. You yeah. know, like, you have to actually go through the hoops. But, um, but for me, I loved it. It worked for me. But, you know, if I was going to do something else with my life, that would have been a waste of my time to go to college. You know, if I was going to be a painter, you know, maybe college wouldn't be the right choice for me. Um, so a record label is like that. It really depends on what your goals are and who you are. So where are you trying to go? How are you trying to get there? And let's say, let's say an artist, uh, they decide that a record label is a good choice for them. Say it's through a very successful one. They're doing really well. Um, the ROI is very, very good. So they have exclusive agreements and non-exclusive agreements. What is the difference between the two? Well, an exclusive agreement, which is, I mean, for a record label, that's really going to be the most common is that it's an exclusive agreement, which means you're signed up with this record label for a certain period of time. It's usually a term of years. Um, and during that time, you can't record for anybody else. You can't release through anybody else. You're theirs, right? So that's that's it. Now, the thing to watch out for, the biggest thing to watch out for is how broad is this deal? Because... The days of a record deal just being a record deal are so far gone, it's silly. Like it's, you know, it's not even, it's it's really rare these days for it to only cover that. These days, it also includes other things like your publishing revenue, your tour revenue, your merch, you know, like, so how much are they taking out of your career as far as their control and their entitlement to, you know, participate in the revenue you generate? So that's something that you've really got to kind of keep an eye out for. So with an exclusive deal, you wouldn't be able to record, release on your own. You wouldn't be able to, um, you know, do anything without the label's involvement and approval. And here's here's the kicker. Usually in these contracts, they're not obligated to release anything you do, and they're not even obligated to send you into a studio. Yeah. So I've actually seen it happen where somebody signed to a major label and the label shelved them. Ooh. Yeah. Like did for not three four years. Yeah. Didn't send them into the studio nothing. It it was terrible, you know? And I was, I cautioned him like, don't sign this contract. Don't, this is terrible. And this particular artist just had stars in his eyes, you know, like, oh, but this is a major label and they like me. And, you know, it's unfortunate because artists are so susceptible to that. Like, oh, they really like me. And this is, this is my big shot. Like, man, you don't marry the first person who asks you out on a date. You know, the same thing with your label. Like you don't, you know, sign to the first label in most instances, you know, maybe, you know, as luck would have it, sometimes the person who asked you out on your first date, you wind up marrying, you know, but 
that's not for everybody. That's not the way it is generally. So you got to be cautious, you know, and you got to really understand what's going on here. So that's, you know, the exclusive thing. Non-exclusivity means that you're signing up with somebody. Usually in this case, it would be like for a single track or, or maybe an EP, maybe an LP, but usually it's like a track or an EP and they control the rights to that. But you can still go and record with other people. Um, it's generally not as common just because once they get their hands on you, they kind of want the whole thing. They don't want you generating money on your other projects based on the money they spent on this one. They want to be able to participate in all of that. And I've seen a lot of, um, I'm in the electronic scene, so I see a lot of electronic labels because a lot of that music is released as singles. Right. So they release a single through a label and it's a non-exclusive contract. Yeah. So they'll release that one single and then the next single, they'll go to a completely different label. Completely different. So that's kind of interesting to see that versatility. Yes. But what are some things to watch out for in that non-exclusive agreement? Because in exclusive, there's all kinds of stuff. Right. There's also stuff in a non-exclusive. Oh, for sure. And the thing, one of the things is that you got to understand that when it's a non-exclusive deal like that, they have absolutely no incentive to develop you as an artist. It's this one track and that's all they care about. It's not about you. So manage your expectations going in and understand it's only this track and that, that can be a problem too because a lot of times people are motivated to do a thing or not do a thing because they value the relationship, you know? So if a label really values an artist and they want to cultivate them, they're going to do things to do that versus like, oh, I'm just getting this one track from you, go away, you know? So that's, you know, first and foremost. Other things um, as far as like that non-exclusive thing is basically we want to look at if it's a world worldwide deal, if it's um, a perpetual deal, so meaning they have the rights to this track forever, or is it just for a certain term of years? Because sometimes that is the case as well. It doesn't have to be a forever deal with that label. Um, you know, definitely how your royalties are calculated and computed. Um, it, it, most notably in a situation where the artist created the track themselves entirely and then delivers it to the label. At that point, the label is, has nothing out of pocket. So what they're recouping should be minimal. Um, you know, a lot of artists in that situation, they will not take an advance because that advance is entirely recoupable. And the thing is, the trick that a lot of people don't realize is that when we say like advances are recoupable, what this really means is the way most contracts are written, that advance is basically paid back out of only the artist's share of the royalties. So like if you write a song and I'm the label and I'm like, oh, hey, I want to release this track. Um, I'll give you, I'll be generous and I'll give you a 15% royalty or even a 20% royalty because I really like you and you're awesome, right? And by the way, here's an advance up front to cover what you're out of pocket in creating the song. And you're like, okay, cool. So let's say I give you like a $5,000 advance, right? So as the money starts coming in from that track, right? Let's say, you know, people are buying it on iTunes. Not that most people do that, but whatever. You know, just because we're, it's easy numbers, we'll say it's a buck, right, for every sale of it. It's not as though recoupment means every dollar that comes in goes into paying down that $5,000, recouping that advance. How it works is a dollar comes in, you get your 15% royalty. So I take 15 cents from that dollar and put it towards the advance payback. The other 85 cents goes in my pocket. So it's going to take a long time. To recoup, exactly. And start and so, making money on that. Yes. Work. And meanwhile, I'm making money as the label and going, oh, you haven't recouped yet, Lennon. Sorry. Like, you're not doing any royalties yet. That's, I mean, maybe go out there and push that track a little harder. And what if the label comes back and, and you know, and say in five or 10 years and you're like, oh, the song is doing really well. Like, it's on Billboard. It's on this and that. Yeah. I've had to have made my money back. Is there a way to, like, get that statement to see how much money? That all depends. Because there are screwy labels. Oh, yeah. That all depends on what's in your contract. Okay. Because your contract has to say that you have the right to audit their books and records. Usually it will say that you have to have a CPA do it. Like, if whoever d drafted that contract for the label knows what they're doing, it will say that you must hire a CPA to examine their books and records, and that you can only do it at most once a year. And so you have that opportunity to make sure there's no shenanigans afoot. Here's the thing. If that's not in the contract, you can't force them to open their books to you unless and until you sue them. Ouch. Yeah, so now you've got to pay money to a lawyer to file suit and go through discovery, and now you're like 20 grand in the hole just in trying to get this lawsuit so you can get to the books 
And what happens if the books reveal that, well, the track was just performing poorly, you know, not as well as you thought, or, you know, something else that it wasn't actually, you know, an underpayment to you. You just spent all this money to figure out your royalties were correct. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, yeah. So you you want to make sure that that's in the agreement. And I've seen lots of disputes over that, especially with like smaller labels, um, you know, ones that have been around for a long time, but, and, and they have some, you know, notable acts that they're affiliated with. Even then, I've seen them basically just blow off their artists and not send them statements. And and that's another thing. Sometimes the contract says, we'll only send you a statement if we owe you money. That's a huge no to me. Like, then how am I supposed to ever find out when I'm going to be getting money if I don't know what the basic, the balance is on, on this advance or when we're going to recoup? So you should always be getting a statement regardless of whether or not you're entitled to a payment at that point in time. What are some examples of a good deal and what are some like, yes, this is a good deal for you or, and some that are bad, like don't like you read the first paragraph or two paragraphs and you don't even like, this is awful. This is just, don't even look at this. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it doesn't even take me too much looking to find something that's terrible. And I'll just like, look at it and be like, this isn't even written well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there will be people that will just like, you know, pound something out themselves and not use complete sentences. And I'm just like, this makes no sense. Um, Yeah. I've seen people use things they find on the internet, totally inappropriate for what's going on, wrong jurisdiction, wrong agreement, wrong everything. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. And punt it back. Um, So, you know, sometimes the, the red flags are massive, you know, other times it's things like devil is in the details. Yes, it is. And, and that's the thing with contracts is like, it's crazy, but something even like the placement of a comma can change the entire interpretation of a sentence and which can change the whole outcome of, you know, what you're entitled to and what you're not. So it's, it's really like a, an art form. And it's also almost like surgical in its precision, a well-drafted contract. And so, you know, some of the things that we kind of look out for, um, you know, what are they taking the rights to? How long is this for? Is there any way for you to get out? Most of the time there's not. I really like to try and negotiate for a way for my artists to get out. Um, and the way I do that is I put some sort of threshold in there that says after the first year or after the first 18 months, if this much money hasn't been made or, you know, or if, if we haven't met this benchmark, the artist has the opportunity to walk. Um, this serves two purposes. One is to give the artist that opportunity to walk and two, to give incentive to that label to actually push the artist because they want to keep the artist. So they want to make sure that they, you know, hit that benchmark at the very least. So that kind of works from both sides, you know? So that's, that's, as an attorney, that's stuff I'm always looking for is how can I incentivize people's good behavior? Mm-hmm. How can I make sure that Promote they're good behavior? Yeah, exactly. Like right. A you know, gardener, right. If, if they're doing good behavior, you reward them. Right. Exactly. You know, the dogs get, give them a treat, you know, like, so, you know, I basically roll with a pocket full of milk bones, you know, I'm like, mm, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm always trying to incentivize this. Um, and so, you know, things like that are, you know, something to look for. Is there any way to get out? Um, is there transparency as far as the accounting goes? You know, things like that's really kind of what you want to look for. Um, other things, I've seen them take rights to pre existing albums without paying for it. And I'm like, whoa, 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 like, why are you signing over the last 10 songs you released and you're not getting paid for it? Like, you, you did those all by yourself, you paid for it all yourself, and now this label wants the rights to it? Like, I get that they want to explain, they really like these tracks and they think they can make money off of them, but why aren't you entitled to anything for it? Mm -hmm. You know, so things like that. Um, So that's kind of, you know, some of the stuff you want to be on the lookout for. And again, like there's a lot more. It just kind of depends on what type of deal it is and what sort of things are in there. Um, One of the other big things to look out for is if, if the label is also taking your publishing, right? So if they're, if they're acting as both a label and a publisher, they generally tend to use your publishing royalties to recoup money they spent on the sound recordings, which if they're two separate entities, you're signed with a label over here and a publishing company over there, the label can't do that. So even though you're recouping with your label, you're getting publishing royalties. So that's something to be aware of is that if you've got a one-stop shop, this is my label and publisher, 
there's a good chance that the label is going to be eating up all of your royalties for the foreseeable future. Um, so that could be a bummer. And then um, one last thing is is be really careful about like a payback clause. Like if you breach the contract, you have to pay them back for money they've spent on you. Um, that's icky. Yeah. And then um, having some control over how much money they spend. Oh, that's interesting. Um, because, you know, let's say, you know, I'm the label and you're my artist and I'm like, oh, okay, well, we're going to record a new track. I want you to use this studio. And you're like, okay, cool. Well, it's my studio. I own it. And I'm going to make you pay like an inflated day rate to go there and then charge that as a recoupable cost to you. And then if you have the payback clause as well in there, yeah. it can really be. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of ways that things can be real janky, you know, like, so it's just, you know, something, you know, lots of stuff to look out for. So I thought of something coming back to the non-exclusive agreements, like signing a single, for example, to yeah. a label. Can a label also put something in, in a contract? I mean, you can put anything in a contract. Right. But is it common or uncommon to see like, oh, any merch sales or anything else outside of the song royalties that is being sold? Can we collect that money? That's more common in an exclusive deal than it is a non-exclusive one. Um, because we don't often see merch that's tied to one particular song. I mean, unless it winds up like on a birthday card or a teddy bear or something, you know what I mean? Like you got to build a bear and your song's there. Um, but you know, otherwise, um, a lot of merch is more like general as far as the artist goes, you know? So it's not really tied to that one track, but when we have a contract where the artist is signed to a label for a term of years, that's very common that the label is going to say, yeah, we want, you know, we're going to handle your merchandising for you, which basically means we're going to take some of your merchandising money, you know, which can be very fruitful. Absolutely. There's so much money in merch. If you really exploit that opportunity and I don't use exploit as a bad word, but you know, Mm -hmm. if you really explore that opportunity and I'm a huge fan of merch just as a consumer, as a music lover, I love getting the t-shirt at the show, you know, because every time I put it on, I'm like, oh, that was a great show. Or, oh, I haven't listened to this artist in a while. I should check them out. You know what I mean? Like I should see what they're up to or whatever. So I'm a huge fan. We'll get to merch in a little bit. Plus, it's also a good way to literally you're giving everything, every dime of that money is going right to the artist. Yeah. Usually. Right. So like if you're if you're paying twenty dollars for a t-shirt, the artist is getting twenty dollars. Right. So it's it's can be very beneficial in in addition to buying their music. Absolutely. So we'll get to merch in a little bit. Artwork. Yeah. For um, this can be kind of, this is another gray area that a lot of people kind of are not familiar with. So every track, every album, every EP has some kind of artwork. Mm-hmm. There should be a deal with the graphic artist. Oh, yeah. How, how should that be protected to ensure that you 100% own that artwork? Because sending it to them and not having an agreement you don't technically own that. Right. Correct? Exactly. And that's it's such a great question because so many people don't even think of that. But um, with the copyrights and the artwork, it's copyrights not like other forms of property in some ways. And one of the ways in which it differs is because, you know, if I sold you my coffee mug, I would, you know, take a couple of bucks, hand you the mug. We don't need a contract. Deal's a deal, right? But for copyrights, it's entirely different. For a copyright, it's got to be in writing and it's got to be signed and you have to use the proper words to transfer the rights. If you don't do that, you don't actually own it. You didn't buy the rights to the artwork. You just bought the right to use it, which is entirely different because if you don't have this contract or if you have one that's not worded properly, what that means is that that artist who created your artwork could continue to use that artwork for other purposes, for other artists for something that you disagree with, but now you're going to be associated with in people's minds because they're going to see that artwork and think of your song that it's affiliated with and go like, oh, why are you supporting that organization? Why, oh, you now, you know, you're selling Cheetos or whatever the case, you know? Um, So you got to be really careful about that. That's number one. And number two is you can get sued for what your graphic designer did. Because if your graphic designer rips somebody off and infringes their copyright or uses somebody's image without permission, you can get sued for that because you're using it in conjunction with your song. So you're infringing that copyright. You're violating that person's right of publicity. And you're just as liable. You're just as liable. It's the same thing as using somebody else's sample, mm-hmm. correct? If, if say, I, you and I wrote a song, 
you use somebody else's sample without me knowing. Right. I'm still just as liable as you are. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, to say like, oh, I was unaware, I didn't know, that is not a defense at all, despite what people put on YouTube all the time. Like, oh, no infringement intended. Don't know about that. You know, like that's, okay, whatever. <laughs> no theft intended doesn't work as a defense in court. No, you know, so. No. Um, so yeah, those are a couple of things you got to be really careful about with your graphic designer is, you know, making sure you're actually getting the rights, number one, and number two, making sure that they didn't do anything to get you sued. And then number three, again, just like with your engineer, what do you expect? You know, setting your expectations and then revisions. You know, if they send you something, it's not common that the first thing you get, you fall in love with, you know? Unless you're working with the top end graphic design. And even then it still might fit your vision, might not fit your vision. You know what I mean? Like I know a few people that do that, you know, that, that do graphic design for, you know, big artists and they do amazing work. But I, I know that it's not always the first thing out of the gate is the one that winds up being used, you know? So, because, you know, we're different people and we have different ideas. And as much as you might communicate to me what your intent is for this work of art, I might, you know, interpret that a different way. So, you know, what is expected as far as revisions and, you know, that sort of thing. And so when that copyright is assigned, that's the word you use, right? Right. When it's assigned to somebody else, you're no longer, say, the graphic designer does get sued for infringement. Mm -hmm. That person that owns it is liable correct? They both are. They both are, even though it doesn't, the graphic designer doesn't own it anymore? True, because they still created it. So okay. they were initially responsible for it. Yeah. So think of it like an infection or a virus. It's not like you like can, like, I can be- infringe, pass it on, and right. I'm, I'm good to exactly. go. Exactly. So like, if I gave you the flu, it doesn't mean my flu is gone. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Like, it's so, if you think of it like that, like that, that infection is always going to kind of linger. Because that was kind of interesting. I'm like, mm, what if that happened? Like, I just like constantly steal people's music. I use it in the people I'm writing for, they don't know that I'm using it. They think it's mine. All of a sudden, they're getting lawsuits and cease <laughs> so and like tag, letter. no tag backs. Like, it's no. like, exactly. I'm like, it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. <laughs> when the song is done and before you release it, you should copyright it. Why? But before you federally copyright it, it does have copyright protections. Yes, exactly. And why is it beneficial to, or why should you copyright with the government to protect it? Yeah, great question. Um, Basically, like what you said is right. The minute you create something, as soon as it's made tangible, you have a copyright in it. As long as it's original, creative, tangible, and tangible means even digital. So um, so you have rights right away. So like if you were to draw something on your piece of paper right now and then I stole it and then used it on my website, it's infringement even though you haven't registered it yet because clearly you didn't have time, Right. Um, But the registration with the U.S. Copyright Office, the point in doing that is it really gives you an an entire arsenal of weapons to protect your work, and it's what you need. Um, Because once you register your work federally, then you're entitled to get a lot more in damages. So if you sue somebody, you're entitled to get up to $150,000 per active infringement. You're entitled to have your attorney's fees and court costs paid for by the person who infringed. You could have customs um, seize infringing goods at the border and impound them and, in- and destroy them. Like it's you, like serious. Like that. If nothing makes you feel powerful, that will. <laughs> like yeah. you're like, damn. <laughs> like that's that's. I, and I've seen that happen before. That's that's no joke. Um, and so, and it's not the goal that you ever want to sue somebody. I get that. But the idea is, again, giving people incentive to behave. You know, if I have to write a letter on behalf of a client that says, hey, you know, you infringed my client's work, it's a lot more likely we're going to get the outcome we want if my letter can say, this is a federally registered copyright and here's what we're entitled to get when we sue you. Because that's scary. It's showing people the big stick you're going to hit them with. Versus if it's- it's a very big stick. It's a very big stick. It's It's terrifying. It's picking up a tree- yeah. And hitting somebody with a tree. Exactly. You're just bludgeoning somebody, right? And so, but without that registration, it's like, oh, well, we could potentially sue you for certain amounts of money that we can prove that we lost because of your activities and, you know, potentially profits that you made if we can prove that that was directly a result of your infringement. Like, that's not scary, no. right? So, you want to stop that behavior and get compensated for what happened as quickly as possible. You want people to be like, <laughs> there's money. You know, like just cough it up immediately. 
if that's what you're asking for, or if you're just asking them to stop, that they will immediately stop. Um, and the registration allows you to do that. Um, and, you know, another thing it does is it makes it easy for people to give you money, which sounds, you know, like, how could I do that? Because the Copyright Office database is searchable online. So if I have a client who wants to use a song in a movie, I have to find out who owns the rights to the song. If it's an independent artist, I don't have any label to track down, right? How do I find them? In the Copyright Office, you can include your name and contact information for licensing requests. So that makes it easy. And I've had clients who've given up on licensing works before and used something else because we couldn't find the owners. So when you're registering the copyright with the Copyright Office, should you, is that something you could do individually, like by yourself? Or yeah. should you have a lawyer do it just to ensure that it's done properly? Or is there no way to really screw it up? I mean, you can screw it up. It's, it's screw upable, but um, it's pretty straightforward for the most part. They have tutorials um, available as, I think it's a PowerPoint and a PDF. Oh, okay. And it goes through like screenshot through screenshot of the application with little fly-in arrows that tell you what to put where. So it's, it's great. Um, Mac users, don't use Safari, use Chrome, use Firefox, use anything but Safari. The whole thing will have a seizure on you if you try to use Safari. Um, <laughs> I use a Mac, <laughs> could you guess? But anyways, here's the thing. It's usually pretty straightforward. It asks for your information, the name of the work. Was this a work for hire? Did you create it yourself? Who are the other writers, if there are any writers? Who owns it? What's the date this was created? What's the date it was released? Sign your name here. Okay, that's, that's essentially it. Now, there, are, there is a section, I think it's section four, where it says, is there any pre-existing work in here? So what that is asking is like, did you sample? Is there somebody else's stuff in here? Is this a remix of somebody else's song? Or is it even a remix of your old song? Right? It's not asking, did you steal from somebody? It's saying, does this thing you're registering have anything else that was previously created? If yes, you must disclose it. If you fail to disclose it, then technically your application was fraudulent. Now, is the Copyright Office going to go now? No. They're, they're not, they're not going to check your song. They get like 10,000 registrations a day. There's no way, right? However, if you ever have to enforce the rights to that particular song and use that application to say like, hey, this is federally registered. If my client was the defendant, I'd get a copy of that registration. I'd look at it and be like, oh, you didn't disclose that this was based on another work. Oh, you committed fraud on the copyright office. This application's not valid. And so all of that was kind of for nothing. Um, so you do have to be honest and truthful in your application, but otherwise it's something that most people can handle on themselves pretty, by themselves pretty easily. And what about if you use a sample? Cause I mean, sample can be something as simple as a percussive instrument, like a kick drum yeah. or it can be, you know, an eight bar loop of somebody else's song. Do you have to disclose that you're using individual samples? Like say you bought a sample pack from a company that makes samples. Right. Do you have to disclose that or like, what's the line there? I would say, if it's a loop, I would say definitely, like an eight bar loop, yes. From somebody else's song. Right, yeah. At that point, yes, for definite, sure. Um, if it's something else, like it's just like a tom hit, like a single tom hit is not a copyrightable element. Like otherwise, like there'd be no drums. Like, there, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, you think about it, like it's like somebody copywriting the letter A. Like, oh, we can't have A's anymore. You know, like, so... You know, that's kind of what you have to look at is go like, all right, is the part that I incorporated, this pre-existing work, is that sufficient enough that it would be considered a copyrightable element, right? So that's kind of basically what we're looking at there, not like, um, you know, something that's like so basic and fundamental that it wouldn't be entitled to copyright protection on its own. What can you, after you register that song with the Copyright Office, what are some things you can do to protect it or how do you monitor it and stuff like that? Um, that's a really good question. At that point moving forward, it's kind of like whack-a-mole. Unfortunately, like that is just the nature of the internet these days. You, you will find it places where it's not supposed to be. Um, that is inevitable if it's any good mm -hmm. <laughs> or if it's really, really bad. <laughs> you know, like people will share it and be like, look at this. Um, but so basically what you do at that point is you take advantage of the what they call the DMCA notice provision. Um, for websites that are based in the United States, they are, if they allow users to upload content, so, you know, YouTube, great example. Um, 
if they allow users to upload content, they must have what we call a DMCA policy on their website. And DMCA stands for Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And what this does is it says, hey, world, we got a bunch of stuff on our website that we don't know anything about. Like users put it here. We don't know what it is. But if you find that your work is being infringed, let us know and we'll remove it. So you have that opportunity to go to the website, go to like their legal section or their terms of service, terms of use, and then you know find their DMCA policy and take it down. Or for things like YouTube specifically, you have another option. You don't have to, your choice isn't leave it up and lose the money or just take it down. There's also a middle road you can take where it's, okay, leave it up, but I want to put ads on that video and take the money. So like if you wrote a song and somebody used it like in their short film or their webisode or whatever, you're like, hey, they didn't even license this for me. But you're like, you know what? I kind of like what they did here, but... You know, so I'm not offended by the use, but still, like... And it's getting a lot of traction. It's getting a lot of traction, but I'm still entitled to some money for the use of my song. What you can do is is just go ahead and use that third option that YouTube gives you and monetize it. So sometimes when you see ads on videos, it's not the person who uploaded the video that put the ads on it. It's the owner of the copyright. And I, I was on YouTube yesterday, and I was fi- it was like a mashup of a song that it was like very... Like, not released. It was just kind of a mashup that some guy did in his bedroom, and it was really good, and I really liked it. And I tried to find it, and I found it on YouTube, and somebody, it was like a mashup of a Skrillex song and a Daft Punk song, and then they added their own, like, drop and stuff like that. And somebody had commented on there, and they're like, who's getting the money for this? And somebody responds saying, oh, the, the uploader. And I just kind of shook my head and I go, no. Most likely not. Most likely not. Yeah. That's not true. And then somebody somebody finally said like, oh, it was the label or Skrillex or whoever owns a copyright. I'm like, thankfully, there's yes. somebody smart out there. That knows what's going on. When I was back in, kind of come back to protecting your song after its release, when I was in Los Angeles last week, or last week, last year for my birthday, there was a couple guys out on the streets like handing out uh, records and mm-hmm. they wanted you to make a donation like, hey, I'm trying to get my music career started. So I rightfully donated 10 bucks and I took the CD. Bad artwork. It was just a picture of him <laughs> with like Snapchat. Like you don't put this Snapchat logo, Instagram logos on your cover <laughs> art. That's just a no-no. And then I went and I put it in the car and I was listening to it and I shazammed it and it was not that artist no so i'm wondering if he actually took that song and just rapped over it and probably you can't listen to a cd there you have to put it in a cd player and then listen to it but right. after that it's too late of course you already bought it yeah he's not going to give you your money back right no of course so i'm just like this guy and he was making all kinds of money so how would you find out about somebody doing that like say That's he so was hard. using my music i would have never known he no, was doing you that. wouldn't have you wouldn't have ever known and that's and that's part of the problem. Like there's there's always going to be some loss. Mm-hmm. You know, like things like that will always slip through the cracks to some degree. You know, at that point, like, you know, might he get busted by the cops for not having basically a peddler's license? Yes. You know what I mean? But at that point, even the cops are probably not going to contact you about it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really hard to you know, really lock down your rights with 100% with any degree of success. Like it's... But what, let's say, let's say I went there and I bought it and I put it in. I'm like, that's my song. Right. What can I do from that point? Oh, well, you know, that goes back to, you know, you can send a demand letter, which, you know, the guy's selling CDs on the street corner. I don't know if he's really going to listen to it was on, demand It was letter. on the Hollywood, where the Walk of Fame is. Yeah. That's where he was at. Yeah. So like like where all the buskers are and everything, yeah. yeah. And so, um, so I mean, is he really gonna care about a demand letter? Probably not. Um, you know, you could file a suit against him, and at that point, that's when you get to find out whether or not the juice is worth the squeeze. Basically, like, does this guy have enough money that it's worth going through the lawsuit, or is he just spending it as fast as he gets it? Right, and it's all under the table. This is all cash in hand. This is not money that's generally going into his bank account. Well, he was, he actually used a square reader. Oh my gosh, did he? Yeah, he did. Oh, well I then. my credit card. Because oh. I didn't have any cash. I'm just right. like, okay, then, you know, I'm in the music industry. I understand the struggle. What the heck? Yeah. I just want to see what this guy's doing. Right, exactly. So, I was curious. It was more out of curiosity right. because I want to see, like, is this guy his music? How good is it? Right. No, I totally it was out understand. Of curiosity, not because it was good. Right. No, I get it. 
But yeah, so like at that point, you know, that's that would be actually a fortuitous thing. Like, oh, he actually uses a square. So now we have a track of like how much money he's made off of your your music and you know how much he has and that sort of thing. And so it's possible, you know, to go after him. So after last point here that I have is promotion. And after everything is done, you've released it. Now it's everything. The song is out on Spotify. It's out on Apple Music. It's time to promote it to get people to stream that song. So merchandise is a good way to to promote that as well. So what are some protections and stuff there that you should be watching out for? You kind of want to think about some of the same things we've sort of been talking about, especially like with your graphic designer. You want to make sure that whoever's creating and designing the stuff, they sign contracts, that everything's free and clear. You're not going to get sued because with what they did. Um, when it comes to the actual merch itself, as far as quality goes, like, you know, if they're being, you know, if it's merch that's being imported in the United States, depending on what the merch is, you want to make sure that it meets com- uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission's minimums. You know, so like when you see on tags, like certain disclosures, like, oh, flammable, you know, like that's not there because the manufacturer is like, hey, heads up, man, like, This could catch fire. It's because they're required to put it on there. So that's something that really should, you know, you want to make sure that the company you're using is legit and on the up and up. Because if they're not, again, that's still potentially your liability. Um, So you want to use a reputable manufacturer for that, for your merch. Um, And um, again, just, you know, making sure that you're not infringing anybody's trademarks or anything like that with your merchandise. You know, that's always a concern as well. Um, And uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the gist of it is just those big issues as far as, you know, making sure you have the rights and making sure that you minimize the likelihood you'll get sued for what anybody else does. Um, So public relations as well. Like I know sometimes people use it to like in the electronic scene, they think of it. It's a huge misconception. They think of public relations. I'm going to give you a thousand dollars and I'm going to be a star tomorrow. Not the case. Nope. Um, unfortunately, and a lot of times that public relations deal or that thing they can pitch to record labels. And sometimes that's either done after the track is done or it's, they sign a deal like, Hey, you're going to write six songs for us or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so is that something you should consider in promotion or should you have that kind of ironed out prior to everything. You know, that's one of those things where it depends on what you're trying to promote. First of all, you know, like, is there a good market for this? Uh, many markets for this, you know, cause when it comes to music, the heat of success is having a wide array of revenue streams, not a single revenue stream. Right. So you want to have money coming in from all directions. Um, you know, so that's a concern first and foremost, is this even worth it? You know what I mean? Is this project worth the push? Um, for that, you need to get independent feedback um, because your mom will always tell you that she loves your stuff. Yeah, It could be the worst thing ever. She will tell you that she loves it. I have got some ugly drawings on my fridge right now because my kid is five, mm-hmm. you know? So, but nonetheless, I love them. They are never going to be in a museum, right? You know, but so get some independent, honest, critical feedback first before you even consider it because spending money to promote something that isn't great will damage your reputation more than it will help it. And damage your wallet. Exactly. So like that's a no win, right? So get some honest critical feedback. Learn to take critical feedback, um, you know, and get it from people whose opinion you value as far as like this person will tell me the God's honest truth about this track, you know? So that's what you're looking for before you even decide to go down that route. Um, and then as far as, you know, using PR... If if you know if you if all you had to do was pay a thousand dollars and it'd be famous, we'd all be famous. No, yeah, we would. You know, like it's everybody would be millionaires. Everybody, we would all be just killing it. You know, like anybody who could scrape together a grand would put the grand there and then be you know wildly famous and rich. So you have to understand what they can and they can't do for you. So you want real concrete goals um, as far as that goes. What is their plan? You know, and and they might not want to fully disclose the plan before you hire them because that makes sense because you could just take their plan and go do it yourself without hiring them. But nonetheless, what are the goals of this? You know, what are some metrics we can meet? Um, What would be great from the artist's point of view is to structure your deal so that it's like, okay, I pay you this much money, and if we hit this benchmark, then I pay you more. You know what I mean? So again, incentivizing the results. Kind of a thing. And do you see often where like public relations people will try to claim 
royalties for a certain period of time on a track because of their promotion? Not really. Um, not in my experience, not saying that it doesn't happen because people will try and claim royalties for everything. Um, but I've not had any experience with that. And it's it's also important to note that like a PR person, depending upon the genre of the artist, the scope in, in the, of the of their activities varies widely, wildly. Um, and also not only the genre of the artist, but um, the, the level of fame they have. You know, like a really good friend of mine is a PR person and she is constantly going, she's, oh, I got to fly to New York because we're announcing this affiliation with this charity. I, you know, and she helps set that whole thing up and then sets up the pre- press conference that goes along with it. Oh, and this artist is going to be on this show. I need to go and be there. You know, so she sets up that appearance on the show, makes sure everything goes well. Here's your talking points. Here's what, you know what I mean? So a, a PR person can do a lot of different things. Um, it just sort of depends on who the artist is and their genre and what their needs are. I think in in the electronic scene, it's 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 kind of I don't think in my experience the people that I've worked with and the people that I see are working PR, they don't go to that extent. It's just hey, I have a song, I'll give you five hundred dollars. You send it to six of these blogs, pitch it to Spotify playlist, and maybe a label. Right. And that's that's it. Yeah. And, and from what I understand, like. Spotify is starting to crack down on the playlists and on the paid they placement. They're they're starting to, like they are not cool with that at all. Well, first of all, it is against their terms and conditions. It is absolutely it is right, and and it goes against the whole notion of this is a great playlist because it's full of great music, not because somebody paid to be on it. And the sad thing is, is, is not only is it against their terms and conditions because of that, but because when you pay somebody, like if I'm a playlist curator and I have connections to Spotify, quote unquote, and you give me. $700 to get your song in three of these playlists, that's not guaranteed because whoever owns that, that playlist can like, Oh, I don't like that track and kick it off yeah, and kick it off. Yep. And then what are you going to do? You're going to come at me pissed off. Right. I just gave you $700. Why is my track not in those three playlists? Right. Exactly. So it can be and a very dangerous slope. Yeah. And it's a great opportunity to defraud people of money. Like, Oh, give me 700 bucks. Oh, sorry, man. They didn't, imp- I couldn't guarantee it. Imp- you know what I mean? Like, it's a fantastic opportunity to just, you know, milk people for money, you know, illegitimately. Yeah, it, it's a scam operation to yeah. me in, in a lot of respects. Yeah. Sync licensing. Yeah. Mechanical licensing. Okay. They can be very fruitful. Yes. And very, very good for especially money wise. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and why is that and what are they? Okay. For so a lot of people? first we'll deal with the mechanical because it doesn't make sense from the name of it. Yeah, it doesn't. You know, like. But, okay, no, it's a podcast, but if I showed you this. It is uh, one of those wind-up things with the paper, and it would play notes. Or not paper, it's, uh, it's got this... The, the cylinder. The cylinder. I don't know what it's called. Yep, there's a metal, metal cylinder with little um, spikes on it, and then, the, you, you know, you turn the crank the handle, and the cylinder spins past a metal comb with little teeth on it, and the teeth are varying lengths. And so when you spin it... You know, so this is like to- like a little teddy bear you had when you were a kid or a music box, right? Mm-hmm. So this is called mechanical music. Um, the reason why it's called mechanical music is when this first appeared, when this was new technology, um, they were like, you know, think of like the industrial age, you know, kind of a thing. They were like, and I always picture somebody with like a waxed mustache being like, oh, it's mechanical music, sorry. You know, like that's in my head. Yeah. Um, like pitching this stuff at a carnival sideshow, mm-hmm. right? And so this was like the very first way that you could capture and replay music without using an instrument, right? So well before vinyl, well before, you know what I mean, all of that stuff, before Edison, there was this. And so because we called it mechanical music, so it was a mechanical process, getting the permission you needed from the owner of the song to recreate their song, they called them a mechanical license, so the name is stuck, even though now we don't really use music boxes as the primary method of sharing music. Um, so mechanical license is permission from the owner of the musical work copyright to um, recreate and distribute their song in an audio-only format. So just like this little music box or like a song that you stream online, audio-only format. Okay, now it's an MP3 instead of a metal device. But nonetheless, it's a reproduction and distribution of the musical work in an audio-only format. Um, So that's a mechanical. Um, Important to note, mechanicals are not for visual, so it's not appropriate for a video or use in a movie or anything like that, just audio-only. And 
The cool thing about mechanicals is that in the United States, we have a rate set for that by Congress. So like, you don't even have to negotiate it. It's already figured out. Um, and it's 9.1 cents per copy distributed. Um, now, the one exception to that rule is, well, actually, there's a couple. First big exception is I can't force you to give me that license if you haven't released it yourself. So I'm like, ooh, Lennon, I heard you wrote a really good song. And in fact, I heard the song. You just haven't released it yet. You played it for me. And I'm like, mm, give me that license. I'm going to release it. 9.1 cents. No. Um, you can refuse. It has to be publicly released. Yes, it's got to. It must have been released in order for me to just be able to just use it and pay you the money, right? And release being defined as it's on Spotify or what's... Yep. It's, it's basically released to the... Like, it's published. So released to the public for sale, lending, lease, or gift. So if it's available out there for the public to consume... That would be released. So under the the rules regarding mechanicals, I don't even really have to ask your permission. I just have to let you know that I'm going to cover your song. I have to account to you the amount of money I owe you on a regular basis, and I have to stay true to your original. So I can't modify it substantially, right? So totally mess with your lyrics, turn it into something that it wasn't as far as that goes. Now, at any point in time, I could say to you, hey, I want to mess with your lyrics. I want to totally change this song up. Can I get a mechanical? You can say yes or no. And the 9.1 rate is still going to you know, be our, our, our guiding star as far as that goes. Can, is that negotiable if you want it to be? Yeah, it is. Um, here's the thing. We can negotiate it down. You can't really negotiate it up unless it's a first use mechanical. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. So, um, so that's a mechanical license. So, um, in the U.S., most publishing companies use an organization called Harry Fox, and Harry Fox handles mechanical licensing on on behalf of lots of publishers. So, most songs that you want to cover, um, you could get a mechanical license through Mary, through through Harry Fox. Not all of them, but most of them. Um, if the song's not available there, if you like search their catalog, it's not there, then you contact the publisher directly and get a mechanical from them. Um, so there's that. And is there, is there an upfront fee for that? Or is it just, Hey, I'm, I'm using your song here. You're going to get this much in royalties. Yeah. If you're doing like Harry Fox, they're going to say, okay, are you doing digital download? Are you doing physical? Are you like, what are you doing with it? And then they'll calculate it and they'll say like estimated how many physical copies, estimate how many digital copies, you know? So again, you don't have a crystal ball. You're not going to know exactly, but you might have a pretty good idea of like, oh, I think that, you know, based on what I've done in the past, I might. If you're going on tour, that's kind of factors in like, right. oh, I'm going to start getting some recognition. And yeah. So you traction. ballpark it yeah. and um, you tell them, oh, you know, a thousand copies, 10,000 copies times 9.1 cents per copy. So even if you're off by like, you know, hundred, it's nine bucks. You know, like you haven't really gone in the hole massively if you went off by, you know. So, and of course, if you need another license because it was wildly successful, you just secure another license. Um, when it's going to be something that's a huge release, um, you know, major artist kind of a thing, they then set up an accounting system um, so that it's not like this pay up front and then as you go, then it's more of like, okay, here's our statements. Here's, you know, exactly what we did. So there's that way to go about it. Um, so yeah, the, the system they have online, if you're going to, if you anticipate 5,000 or fewer copies, um, you can use their song file system, which is, I mean, that whole process, it kind of works like Amazon. You know, you go and search for what you want, put it in your shopping cart, pay it and go. Um, so that's pretty easy. So that's a mechanical. Um, so anytime somebody wants to cover your song, um, and and that's for non-visuals. You can't have a visual with a mechanical. Right. That's exactly. a completely separate license. Yes. And that separate license is the synchronization license or sync license. Um, cause sync is easier to say really, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so sync is appropriate anytime there's a visual element. So a lot of people think movies, um, television shows, commercials, also video games. Um, cause there's a visual element, um, potentially apps depending upon what's going on in the app, you know? So any visual element combination there, we say the music is being played in time synchronization with the visual element. What about if it's, say, for example, I get a sync license for a song that you wrote and it's not like a, a video, it's like a presentation that I'm um, like dancing to, or if it's something else, like I'm giving a, a PowerPoint or something like that. So is there, is there, is it a little bit different? Potentially, because 
What you could do is just use the music in conjunction with your PowerPoint, not have it in like as part of a um, complete deck that is automated. You know what I mean? Which that's the big difference there is like, oh, okay, so if I'm going so through some slides and at this point I'm going to play a clip of this song, that's not really a sync per se because it's not timed synchronization. The slide is static and I'm playing a clip of a song for whatever purpose. So that would just really trigger the public performance right of the venue to play the song. Potentially also, you know, if I made a copy of it. Yeah. What if you were showcasing something like, say you invented something and it's, or you're showcasing something you built. Mm-hmm. And you're showcasing that and you have music. You're kind of describing it and you have like an underlying bed. Because that's visual, technically, correct? Um, yeah, but that still wouldn't be within time synchronization because it's okay. a live, perf- live okay. exhibition, as it were, as opposed to like a videotaped one. But that's a really good question. Um, and, so, and, and oddly enough, that's why a lot of artists have a hard time controlling the use of their music when politicians use it without their permission. Because if you use it at like a campaign rally, all you have to do is pay the public performance fee and you technically haven't infringed the copyrights, but man, do the artists get mad because their it song will get- It happened the last election. It happens every election. Every election. Some artists, like I have money on the table, bet. Election's coming up. Somebody is going to use something and some artist is going to like lose their mind over it, which I mean, I understand. I totally get it. Or like uh, that one girl in Kentucky for the the court and she used, I think it was Eye of the Tiger Mm -hmm. and she came out and they just went berserk at her. Yep, exactly. And they shut it down. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So if it's just being played at like a rally, that's a public performance. If it's used in like a campaign commercial, that's a sync license that the artist can do something about. Um, Sync licenses are totally negotiable. They can go as low as a dollar. You can go up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. It just, I mean, it's what's the value value of the music and what's the budget of the person using it. Um, but the beauty of the sync license is that it's the gift that keeps on giving. Because let's say that, you know, your song gets placed in a commercial. You get a sync fee for that song being in a commercial. Not only that, but now this commercial is broadcast over, you know, network television or cable television, you get performance royalties on the back end every time that song is played. And so not only do you get your sync fee up front, but now you get your public performance revenue on the back end. And that's a huge bump if we're talking about something that's again like a network television. Like that's a lot of money because a lot of people see that's it. So I like and a lot of like what uh, Charlie Sheen did in Two and a Half Men, he would write jingles for companies like that and that's where he made his money absolutely and there is a lot of money because you can write one song and retire off that and just think if you can keep writing songs yeah you can retire off of 50 songs 100 oh. songs yeah absolutely and it's you know it's in in you know or just the one knock it out of the park song like you know with inner circle with their song bad boys that, nobody when that came out thought that was going to be some great iconic song like okay it's fun but you know well, as soon as I got used for the intro music for Cops, these guys are set. Their kids are set. Their grandkids are set, right? Like, because that show was on for, I don't even know how long, 15 years, 20 years, and it was constantly on. And it still airs. And it still airs, like, and they still make money off of every time, so. So I've always, I've even thought about, like, just doing that eventually is just writing jingles, because I had a class when I was going to school at Full Sail that yeah. way we would just write jingles or a little, like, 30 second adverts. There's so much money in it. That was so much fun too. And there's can be a lot of money. Just think if you write a song for an Apple commercial, you're set. Absolutely. Trillion dollar company. Yeah. The guy that wrote the intro music for like the, the CBS evening news with Dan rather was making six figures a year off of the fact that he wrote that song because so many people used to watch Dan rather five nights a week that that one bit of music he made for that television show set him up for life. And what about if you wrote music for, say, I know this is a little bit different, but if you wrote music for a a movie Mm -hmm. and it's played in the theaters, how how are those royalties? There aren't. Oddly enough, theaters are exempted. So, okay. So I did hear, that was my next question, was I heard a rumor, I didn't know if it was was going to confirm with you for a while now, is when a movie is played in a theater, there's no royalties being collected. No public performance royalties, right. That's an exception to the rule. But once that movie goes from theatrical to television so it goes to hbo or it goes to netflix or now boom now boom exactly so when i go and see a movie and hans zimmer is the composer or john williams is the composer he's not making any money on that public performance right there's no other royalty coming in for that there's 
just nothing? Well, I mean, depending upon, I mean, if you're Hans Zimmer, you could basically ask for the moon. I, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. be like, they'll be like, yes, here's the moon. Would you like a side of ice cream with that? You know, like that's, I mean, so, you know, whether or not he actually gets another form of net profit participation, it's not unlikely. I don't know for a fact whether or not he does, but I mean, if I was Hans Zimmer, I'd ask for it. it why not? Right. So, um, but in general, you know, for your average, you know, composer, then no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw him a couple years ago live here in Orlando when he said Dr. Phillips. Oh, wow. That was just like, I was in awe because he, they actually had the graphic design team or the visual people come out from, they were based in London. Uh huh. And they had the interstellar effects playing as he was playing live. It's amazing. I was just like, it was totally just mind blowing. I was like, oh my I bet. God. Have you seen the Netflix special with him? No, I haven't. I have it saved to my list, though. Yeah, watch that. It's I good. have to watch it. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is touring and live performances. Okay. How how does that? Why should artists tour to promote their music? Is it good? When should you tour? When should you not? How do you collect your royalties, even for like little gigs at a little fair or something like that? Yeah. So yeah, touring's a great idea. Um, if you haven't toured before, you kind of got to hit your wagon to somebody else's star. You know, like you got to open for somebody, open for somebody. Right. And there's no shame in that. You know, that's great exposure, especially when it's somebody that you're complimentary, like the style of music is complimentary. Um, you don't want to be too much like them because you will be judged in comparison to the headliner that people already love. So you do want to be different. You want to be your own style, but you know, something that you would think would be a good, um, sort of crossover situation. Like, Oh, if they like this, they'll probably like me too. So you want to do that for sure. Um, and build that up. I usually tell people build up your hometown first and then go on the road. Um, that being said, um, for some people, they tour better than they do at home. It's weird. Those are the outliers. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, so that's the first thing is, you know, when you're touring, try to, you know, open for people that, you know, are going to bring in a good crowd and then do your damnedest to put on a fantastic show and be memorable. Um, do your damnedest to get engagement from those people who are there that is going to be continuing engagement. It always boggles my mind, and I feel like a stage mom when I say this, but when I go to a show and the artist is up there and they mention nothing about the fact that they have merch, they mention nothing about the fact that, hey, follow me, hey, this is how you stay in touch with me, hey, this is where you can see me now. You know, like no promotional anything I'm like, you know, <laughs> out in the crowd, like, give us your this, give us, you know, like, tell us things, you know, because um, that's your opportunity. You know, you've, you've got this audience, tell them how to stay with you and continue to support you. So, you know, don't miss that opportunity. Um, as far as like the practicalities of touring, it can be rather expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. Because you're constantly on the road, you know, you're eating at drive throughs you're, you know, sleeping in a van, or if you're lucky, staying at hotels or crashing on friends' couches or, you know, Gas whatever. those vehicles. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, I know it's not always possible, but if you can, you know, make sure you've got um, <laughs> an emergency fund, you know, your car breaks down or whatever. Um, I cannot recommend strongly enough that you pay for insurance on your gear. Because I hear about people's vans getting broken into all the time and all of their stuff gets stolen. And if you're in the middle of a tour, you're now dead in the water. You've got nothing to, to play with. You can't perform, right? And you probably don't have the thousands of dollars laying around to repurchase everything you just lost. And the fact of the matter is, with a theft like that, it's not likely the cops are going to find it. You know, so get you can get gear insurance. It's cheap. Buy it, right? So that that way, if that happens, you're covered, right? So, and you know, of course take pictures of what you own and the serial numbers and all that stuff. Um, so that's a big one. Also, you know, when people start getting a little bit larger as an act and more recognition um, in their contracts, making sure that there's, this is a huge thing these days, making sure there's adequate security at the venue, that it's the venue's responsibility to make sure that there's adequate security. Because, um, you know, if, if something horrible happens, that could fall back on you, that you were at least partially responsible for the fact that there wasn't adequate security at the venue that night. 
Um, so that's you know that's what happened with um, the plaza and the lawsuits that have have come about from you know the shooting there was you know oh well there was inadequate security because they did have security at the doors but the guy got through yeah and that was for the Christina Grimmy yes yeah yep I I was a big fan of her so that was a lot of information so kind of recapping um, just like some things that I starred before you even start writing music you should. I have five things. Sign up for a PRO. Have that. Yes. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Possibly have your publishing deal figured out. Register with Sound Exchange. We didn't talk about that, but we can discuss that in an, in the article unless you yeah. want to talk about it now. Yeah, no, Sound Exchange is, is like a PRO, but for the sound recording side. So that's the quick and dirty on it. Yeah, basically yeah. all it is. And then having a record deal figured out, um, that's kind of a circulating thing. Sometimes people have it figured out before they start writing music, and sometimes it's after they're done. Um, and then having your, your slogan or your name trademarked, copyrighted. Yeah. And, and as far as that goes, which we didn't even really get into is, is it's really important to make sure that the trademark's clear before you start using it. Cause it, it's terrible to start building up name recognition only to have somebody else come after you and be like, Oh, we've been using that name first. You can't use it anymore. And you might think like, Oh, well they're a metal band and I'm electronic. There's no confusion. It's music. Yes, there is. Mm-hmm. You know? So that's one of the things, too, is you don't want to spend time and effort promoting something that you can't continue to use. What if, say, is it a little bit different if, say, you're a band, but then you have a donut stand in northern Washington? Yes. That's completely different. Right, because, yeah, with trademark, it's all about likelihood of confusion. So what that means is, yeah, the donut stand and the band might be the same name, and that's fine. But it also means that if you're in the same industry, the names don't have to be identical. I mean, like, a great example of that was, like, the Dead Mouse logo. And Disney pitching a fit over it. But Disney will go after anybody that has. True. But the thing with trademark, and normally I fully agree, like Disney is, is hyper aggressive. But the thing with trademark is if you don't enforce your rights, you start to lose them. That's true. So it, it's kind of like they're almost, it's legally incumbent upon them to do something At about it. At least try. At least try. Just exactly. To kind of say, like, hey, yeah, so we that, will. In the future, somebody couldn't say, oh, well, Disney stopped enforcing their rights to the Mickey logo. Years ago, because they didn't go after this guy, you know. So I can understand in in that particular instance, you know, what their motivation was. Yeah, well, that covers anything I, everything I had. Um, So if there's anything you wanted to jump in and add, if there's anything that we could elaborate on, or if there's any, like, thing that we didn't talk about that you think is important. Uh, Not that I can think of, now that we hit that We can touch everything, and then I'll link, um, like, the articles we've written to the site and then okay. I'll hopefully talk. Maybe there's probably some additional questions I'll send you just to kind of add that we didn't talk about that. I'll come up with probably as I'm driving home. Right. It's always the way. It's always the way. Um, so yeah, thanks for being on and I really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this episode of When Life Hands You Lennons. I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Miss Davy J. I always enjoy sitting down with Davy and visiting and really kind of picking her brain and learning about the legal aspects of the music industry because there are kind of a lot. And I have preached before how important it is to at least have a basic understanding of copyrights and trademarks so you can keep yourself and potential collaborators uh, that you're collaborating with out of trouble. I would also appreciate and encourage you to support this podcast via through patreon and i would also really really appreciate it if you would give this podcast a five-star review on apple Podcasts, as it does help it get discovered to other listeners all of the social media links to for me will be in the show notes below and if you have any questions about this episode please send them to me via social media and i will do my best to answer them or send them over to Davy so she can answer them. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of When Life Hands You Lennons.